I had garnished my salad with these nasturtium flowers. And I was showing this to my colleagues. I had my little vial of homemade dressing. I shook it up, put it on my salad. And then all of these aphids started coming out of the nasturtium flowers. I guess the oh. aphids didn't really like my salad dressing and uh, <laughs> they decided to march. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that helps you grow food, whether it's on a balcony, in a backyard, or bigger. I'm your host, Stephen Biggs. And I'm your host, Donna Balzer. Together we talk with gardening experts, and we talk about what we've done in our years in the horticultural trade, helping you bend the rules and grow food in a way that suits you and your growing zone. Welcome to this episode of the Food Garden Life Show. Today we will be talking about edible flowers. And uh, I thought, Donna, I would just share a, a story of my own foolishness, maybe as we get started, because uh, when I was a, a young bachelor and I was gardening, I was taking all my own salads to work and probably showing off a little bit. And the one day I had garnished my salad with these nasturtium flowers and I was showing this to my colleagues. I had my little vial of homemade dressing. I shook it up, put it on my salad. And then all of these aphids started coming out of the nasturtium flowers. I guess the oh. aphids didn't really like my salad dressing and, uh, and they decided to march. So um, I can't, you know, it's a long time ago. I can't remember what I did, but I suspect I probably ate it anyway because <laughs> I didn't want to let on that I had all of these aphids in this salad that I've been bragging about to all of my colleagues. Oh, Steve. And that is such a great example of an edible flower. I love nasturtiums, but who's going to be able to eat them after that? Yeah, well, just to wash your <laughs> nasturtiums before you eat them. Yeah, so anyway, I think that's maybe a fun start, but we can dig into more serious stuff now. And let me tell you about the, the really fun edible flower that we've grown the last couple of years called Szechuan Button. And this is a really neat one, also known as the toothache plant. And when you take a little nibble of these flowers, it has this numbing effect on your tongue. It's a really weird feeling. So it's not something that I'd recommend springing on your guests and putting on a salad. No, you don't want to do that. But it's a really fun novelty if, uh, if you want to grow it and, you know, you can say to friends, look, here's something really cool. Try this. No, it'll give you this weird sensation in your mouth, but it's kind of a fun thing. Plus it's a pretty flower. Hmm. So, so there's well, another funny little story for you. Well, I want us to say that another use of nasturtiums, although we haven't gotten full hog into nasturtiums yet is to pickle them and serve them the way you would serve capers. Is it the seed that you're pickling? Is it the flower bud? What is it exactly? It is the green seed that you pickle. It's not the flower bud because the buds are quite big already by the time they're buds compared to a caper. So mm -hmm. kind of fun. Very fun. Do you want to do this alphabetically today? Like I would love to start with begonias. Well, why don't we do it this way? Let's do sort of broad categories. So vegetables, then herbs, then flowers, and then we'll finish off with shrubs and trees. Okay, well, let, so as we dig into veggies, let's start with arugula also known as rocket. Do you, is that a flower that you eat in your garden, Donna? Oh, all the time. Love it. I used to stop eating it when it bloomed because I thought, oh, can't eat those leaves anymore for my pizza or my salads. But then I found out just how delicious and spicy the flowers are. They're really amazing. They're either white or yellow, and you can just pick them at the same time that you're picking the leaves. They can go on and on and on unless you're letting them reseed, which is also a good idea. Okay, that's good. Now, I think one that you'll give a, a strong vote for will be fennel because I find the fennel flowers, they bring in all the beneficial bugs, all the pollinators, all your little tiny wasps and all these beneficial bugs. I grow the bronze fennel and those clumps or those heads of little flowers are just swarming with all these beneficial bugs. But anyway, the fennel flowers are edible, as is the pollen. And I remember talking to a chef who would use fennel flowers on a white plate. He would tap them over the edge of the white plate to oh. decorate it with the fennel pollen. And well, so I thought that was a fun little trick. But you could use the flowers from 
the bronze fennel, which doesn't form the bulb, or if you're growing the Florence fennel, which forms the bulb, it too, you can eat those flowers and use them in the same way. So it's, it's pretty versatile, but also good just from that whole aspect of attracting all these good bugs to the garden. Now, in some areas, these fern leaf fennels, as they're called, have been named as invasive. So just be careful to check your own area because I was giving away seeds because they produce a lot of seeds. And the seeds are so lovely. They taste like licorice. But someone stopped me and said, hey, that's, a, that's considered an invasive weed in this area. So just be careful to look at your own lists of invasive weeds because the yeah. fennel is a fantastic one. And I love that idea of tapping just the pollen. I think that is incredible. Yeah, it's a fun idea. So, and you know, I just want to get in. I know you don't grow broccoli because we've talked about that in past weeks, but it's the same as arugula. It's in the same plant family. So, it also, the kales and the broccoli, when they go into bloom, if you're in a climate that, that lets them overwinter, you'll get a lot of blooms on those. And they really attract early season pollinators because they've overwintered. Those flowers are also lovely, especially in a stir fry. It brings so much color to it. Yeah, that, that's a good addition too. I wanted to jump back to that uh, thought on invasiveness too with the fennel because it brings up such a good point. And I was just going to add to that that invasiveness is such an interesting topic because what can be a terrible invasive in one place isn't invasive at all in another. And it really, really depends on the growing conditions. So mm -hmm. yeah, just a, a good thing to think about. We have trouble actually growing, you know, that beautiful bronze fennel in some of the cooler regions, but it has become invasive on the West Coast. Okay, good. Uh, still talking about veggies, I wanted to mention pea flowers. Do you eat pea flowers? I do, but strangely, sweet pea flowers are poisonous, while right. fresh pea flowers are fine. I mean, isn't that strange? Yeah, that's a good, really good that you mentioned that. So for people who are thinking about peas and edible flowers, the sweet pea, which to be clear is grown as a cut flower, is not edible. But your garden peas where you're eating the pea pods, those flowers are indeed edible. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Donna. Mm -hmm. And they're so tasty, those. The only risk of eating your pea flowers is that then you don't get the pea. But if you're doing something special for... Oh, yeah. You know, a special salad that's kind of fun. Or within a day, they'll make a little teeny tiny pea pod. So you'll still have part of the flower and the pea pod. It's really quite fun. Really fun for kids too. So uh, squash is another edible vegetable flower. And when I was teaching at Durham College, they had this really neat um, farm to table program. So their culinary program was linked in with their farm. And I remember the one day the chef had put in an order for these zucchini these summer squash that still had the blooms attached at the end because whatever dish he was creating that was part of the look that he wanted so they were harvesting these zucchinis while they were still quite small and they had that flower attached at the end so uh, you can do that yes. but you can also pick those as standalone flowers i know i've picked them and stuffed them with cheese and breaded them and deep fried them so lots of different ways you can use them. everything deep fried is fantastic i think we've agreed on that before oh yeah with the zucchinis, I was when I first heard you could eat them, I thought, well, wait a minute, then you won't get the zucchini, which is true. Your chef was asking for the female flowers. But the good news is zucchinis also have male flowers. They're never going to produce a flower, you know, a little fruit anyways. So look at your zucchini plant while it's in bloom. Leave some of the males because you do need some pollination. Well, I was going to say something Just else. Just to the males. Come on. Now. Yeah. <laughs> just take those male flowers so they don't have the little tiny female part on them. So those are the male flowers. They're usually a long, thin stem. And those are just as lovely to eat as stuffed. And they have a bit of a, can't even really describe the flavor, but like you, I like to stuff them with a ricotta cheese and maybe dip them in a light batter and deep fry them. Quite lovely. Very nice. Okay, so we talked about a few veggie flowers, and of course there's more, we're just skimming the surface here, but let's think about herbs. And the first one on my list is basil. Oh, I love basil. Basil. It's so, it's so <laughs> good. I'm gonna send you that, that, that webpage with how to pronounce it. I think you're, you're influenced by the British, Steve. I think that's where we're coming mm. from here. Okay, you know, so potato, basil. Potato, flowers. basil, basil. So you've eaten the basil flowers? 
Yes, lovely. So, um, and I love them as a garnish. And I love them as a garnish if we're doing a tomato bocchini salad with, uh, with basil on top, but also a few basil flowers. I think it looks stunning. It's that whole layered thing, right? Chefs mm -hmm. love to layer the flavors. So even picking the flowers ahead of time and putting them in your oil before you pour them on your salad is quite nice because it infuses that oil with that basil flavor. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's jump ahead to something that has a very different flavor, borage. And uh, it's mm. a fun one. I, you know, interestingly, I've heard that borage is grown as a, a specialty oilseed crop in Manitoba. I've never mm -hmm. bought borage oil, but anyway, I grow borage in my garden for the beautiful blue color of the flowers and also the fact that they're edible. And I'd, I'd describe the flavor as being a little bit cucumber-like. How about you? Yeah. No, I was going to say they're like eating a little cucumber. So it makes, mm -hmm. they look like a beautiful blue. I mean, that color, that blue borage flower color, it's really hard to get. Yeah. But the flavor is so unexpected. So they're really nice in mixed drinks or even a glass of water I've done with the flour individually put one flour in each of my ice cube tray sections poured water on them and frozen them and then served them that way it's so refreshing and like they say cool as a cucumber they are refreshing very and nice. beautiful love 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 the borage flour yeah it's it's a color of blue that you rarely see in the garden so it's pretty mm -hmm. special just for that alone yeah, I mean, which is why you hate to pick it, because then you're not going to have it in the garden. But, you know, we're looking forward to a special party in August or something, preserving yeah. the borage. I guess one last thought on borage, too. For me in my garden, this is one of those plants that readily self-seeds. So mm -hmm. if I let it drop seed, I can count on it coming back year after year, and I don't have to buy more seed. No, that's fantastic. I actually, maybe I'm picking too many. I haven't had that problem, but um, I do love borage. It's a great herb. Okay. Uh, other herbs I eat, I eat cilantro. Do you eat mm. cilantro? Yeah, I love cilantro and that's a good one. And you know, the problem with cilantro is it goes to flower more quickly than we want usually. So at least when it goes to flower and you eat those flowers, I, I feel a little bit gratified because I don't always feel I've got my money's worth out of the cilantro leaves. Or, or, or I talked to a chef in Calgary, Andrew, and Andrew, who was teaching at the culinary school, loved the really green bore, um, cilantro seeds. So before they turn brown and then fall off and reseed, so they flower and then the seeds turn green, he collects those green seeds because he uses his mortar and pestle and serves that with salmon, which I thought was an amazing oh, flavor good. combination. Yeah. I know some people simply do not like the flavor of cilantro, but I love it. And so I love the flowers as well as those green seeds. And then let a few go to seed if you want, but really mm. fun. Okay, good. And let's see, we skipped over uh, chive and chamomile. So just throw mm. those out there as a couple other edible herb flowers. Dill which is up there with fennel in terms of attracting all these great pollinators and insects to the garden. And it's these fine little yellow flowers. Do you use dill flowers at all? You know, it's my husband's favorite flavor. Oh. Helpful husband does a lot for me in the garden. So I do serve him dill, but I'm not fond of dill. It's just something I'm not fond of, but he loves it. So I do use the leaves and sparingly the flowers. We have more edible flowers, more edible herb flowers, ornamental flowers, and finishing off with a couple of trees and shrubs. That's coming up in just a moment. A shout out today to Irv in Ottawa and Irv great to hear that you're growing bananas in Ottawa and thanks for checking in about your figs. We're always adding lots of new articles to foodgardenlife.com all about how to grow your own whether it's fruit vegetables herbs things like edible hedges or specific crops like cardoon and recent articles include how to use wood ash in the garden 
also a list of seed companies because it's that time of year when we're ordering seeds. Find all of that at foodgardenlife.com. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. The show that helps you grow food, whether it's on a balcony, in a backyard, or bigger. And now back to our chat about edible flowers. I feel like you just jumped ahead of something else, though. Now I've forgotten it. Well, uh, I'll keep going on my list. Chives. People think chive flowers are complex. So a chive flower can look like a big rock that you've lobbed at your salad. It's just huge. Yeah. The leaves are nice, finely cut, but a chive... I would say a chive flower is better served kind of pulled apart because each individual part of that flower tastes like a little green onion, tastes like a chive, but a big chive flower is just too big in anyone's salad. I think it's just really bulky. That's a good tip. And you know, it's a little bit corky in the, in the center. So when you pull it apart like that, you don't have to deal with that. So Mm -hmm. chives, and I think we can throw in there garlic chives too. You would treat in that same way. We should throw in mint. Mint flowers oh, are edible. Right. Mint flowers. Oregano flowers, because they're they're in the same family. Oregano flowers are edible. Yeah. And rosemary. That's such a, a well-known herb. And those beautiful, I don't know quite the word to describe that shade of bluey purple, but those rosemary flowers can look amazing. So, mm-hmm. so they're a little bit more work to pick off because they're sort of lined up and down the stem. Not like a chai flower. It's right there in front of you. You pull uh-huh. one and you're you're good to go. But um, yeah, love that. Love it. And this makes me think of one last herb, Donna, is um, thinking of picking off those little rosemary flowers made me think of lavender. And one of the most uh, amazing ice creams I've ever had was an ice cream that was made from lavender flowers. Now, I would never have put together ice cream and lavender. And I was even reluctant to try this. But once I did, I was sold on it. It was really good. Uh, the that taste of the lavender flower with the creaminess it worked so well together so lavender flowers that sounds nice now a chef would probably combine the sweetener as a lavender honey with la- you know that layering yeah sounds fantastic yeah well let's jump in so we've talked about vegetables we've talked about some herbs that have edible flowers let's talk about some more common annuals with edible flowers. What's on your list? I love begonias, the big fluffy double begonias that if Uh, you've got a north facing host, you'll always have as a hanging plant outside. Again, like the chives, I just would pick one flower and then pull the flower, the, the actual individual parts apart because begonias are like lemons. They're so, they're just like lemons. So adding that to a salad can add a really nice flavor. It's not strong. It's lemony. The the individual petals are very soft. And best of all, they come in different colors. So you can have a white if it's a a wedding. You can have a pale pink. You can have a red or an orange if you want it to look zesty. But it always has that same adorable lemon flavor and really soft on your mouth. I love begonias. Oh, that's good. I've never tried begonia. So Mm. this year will be the year. Okay. Okay, uh, If we're still in the letter B section, I put in a vote for bee balm or uh, Menarda. And I guess thinking back to the chives where you're suggesting plucking out the the little flowers with the the Menarda flowers, you want to pluck out those little flowers and then toss that in, I'd say, with a fruit salad. I'm thinking lots of blueberries and chopped melon. And it mm. adds just a delicate spiciness into that, which is really, really nice. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great idea. I didn't know about that one. But let's talk a little more detail about nasturtiums because we started with that at the beginning. And that's a flower you might be growing in your garden because it's a great ground cover. It's nice and raised pots, but it's also you can get a climbing nasturtium. So if you have a smaller garden and you want to do some vertical growing, you can grow some of the types of nasturtium up the pot. My very favorite one is an old fashioned open pollinated 
variety called Alaska. Have you grown Alaska? Yes, it's Sturgeon's the one with the variegated oh. leaves, I think, right? I know. And so again, back to the same chef, Andrew, he showed me how in chef school, they use a single leaf. I know we're talking about the flowers and the flowers are edible, but he also uses a single leaf and he floats it on a soup and then puts a nasturtium flower on top because it's so spicy and peppery. I'm sure at the cooking school, they wash them for aphids. I don't think they would be stuck <laughs> with a, a salad like you, but they're beautiful. And so use the leaves, which can be edible also in a salad. And he did some fancy salads. They call them plated salads instead of just a tossed salad. So they start with a little nasturtium leaf. And some of them can be quite large, especially of that variety, Alaska. Put it on the bottom, put some mixed greens, maybe some reds, like you were talking with beets before. And you were speaking about mizuna, which is a lovely ruffly, or even some kale leaves, little finely ruffled leaves. And then top that with a nasturtium flower. I think that would be because of the peppery flavor. Oh my gosh, I'm so hungry now. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking back to, well, to our friend Denise Schreiber from Pittsburgh, who wrote the book, Eat Your Roses. And she joined mm -hmm. Emma and me here on the show. I don't know, must be five years ago, but I remembered Denise talked about a lasagna, uh, a lasagna made with nasturtium flowers. Oh, and it sounded like such a fun, creative way to use those flowers. Well, I don't know if I have that many flowers that I'd want to cook them in a nasturtium, but hey, what, or in a lasagna, but what mm -hmm. layer would they replace or where would they be? In that? Well, you could do as much or little as your supply dictated. Yeah, okay. Okay. All let's that extra on. protein with those bugs too, eh? Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing about nasturtiums, they do have a range of colors. So they come from that very pale, peachy tone through to a bit more harsh orange. And then uh, almost the Imperial India ones are sort of a reddish brick color. So there's quite a range of colors. A nice mix of colors to, to play with. I wanted to mention daylily. And you mm. can stir fry daylily buds, but there's a picture that really stands out in my mind. Somebody showed me a picture of a child with an open daylily flower that had a scoop of ice cream in it. And, and that always stayed with me. It was such a beautiful picture and a, such a fun idea for an edible flower. I think that sounds fantastic. It's hard to buy edible flowers because they're perishable, right? It's yeah. easy for us as gardeners to go out and pick one daylily or a handful of nasturtiums or some male zucchini flowers, but it's really hard for the, the big processors to do this. And so I have seen them at farmer's markets, but I've rarely seen them at the grocery store. Have you seen mm -hmm. them commonly sold? Oh, very rarely. No, yeah. they're too perishable. Yeah. So it is a big advantage. People say, well, why be a home gardener? What do you, what's your goal with that? But even if you have the tiniest balcony, you can certainly, if it's north facing, fit in a single begonia and mm -hmm. have that single flower that you contribute to your you know, to your supper. Okay, I have a couple more I wanted to squeeze in here. Calendula, okay. which is an oh, annual yeah. that self-seeds in our garden all the time. We love it. And those flowers, you, you pluck off the petals before using them. And I wanted to throw out the idea you can dry them too. So Emma has dried calendula petals. We have a jar of them. And when you do, say, a nice rice dish, you can sprinkle on top of it once it's cooked some of these dried calendula petals to add a splash of color so it's now, a fun one easy to yes. grow calendula is often called pot marigold not yes. pot not marigold it's a different plant completely and i like how you're using the latin name there because it is one of those plants with a lot of common names mm -hmm. but like you i've seen it used as a saffron substitute so if you can't afford that highly priced saffron which is just the tiny little mm -hmm. you know, anther of a single crocus that only blooms in the fall that's a very small portion of a flower not even the whole flower but calendula is cheap easy reseeds you're right it's such a great substitute in rice or in if you're making a paella it's very yeah. good what about rose petals? We will once in a while chop up some rose petals and throw those into a fruit salad. Sometimes towards the center, the petal can be a little bit more white and that portion can be a little bit bitter depending on the rose variety. But uh, rose petals are an easy one because so many people are growing roses anyway. Do you use those? Yes, but not a 
bought one, not one that you brought home from the store, because roses are quite heavily sprayed to exclude the aforementioned bugs. So I would use roses that are from a plant I've had in my garden for at least a year. And then, yeah, go for it. I mean, what a beautiful addition to a salad to add some yellow rose petals or to add some white rose petals to a fruit salad with, oh, all of the many berries that are so delicious. Let's let's jump into trees and shrubs, Donna. And in our garden, we've long had elderberry, the Canada elderberry. And I love it because we make juice out of those berries. But even more fun than that is that we use those flowers. So elderflower cordial, elderflower champagne. Some people dry them to make an elderflower tea. Or I've even heard of people making elderflower Fritters. So that's one. The other common shrub that uh, I've enjoyed eating, grazing from, is lilacs. My parents had a lilac hedge. And even as a little kid, I remember plucking those little lilac flowers, sucking up the nectar. And if only I'd known at the time that I could eat the flower too, I definitely would have. I wanted to add in one tree that's very common here in Toronto. I don't think it grows in your zone, but the eastern redbud tree, which is covered with these beautiful pink flowers in the spring. There's also a, a white variety too, but usually it's the pink ones you see. Those are edible, a lovely sweet flower. Hmm, That's really great. I, I know that people make honey out of lindens, and so we can grow lindens and we can eat linden honey, but it would be pretty hard to pick the flower because it's quite a big unit with that small little flower off of it. I'm glad you mentioned that because my, my great aunt Anna made linden flower tea. So she would get me mm. to pick those linden flowers for her and then she would dry them to make tea. So thank you. That adds a second tree onto our <laughs> list. And, and of course, there's others. So we've just scratched the surface with these trees, shrubs, veggies and herbs. There's lots of edible flowers out there. But I think the, the key thing is, if it's something that you don't know for sure, is just do your due diligence. Research it. There's lots of books on the topic. There's lots of seed. A lot of seed companies now are listing what is ed has edible flowers and what does not. So there are lots of resources out there. Okay, that sounds fantastic. I think yeah. check first, then eat. But definitely think about adding some of that beauty that comes from nature right into your right into your salads, soups, whether it's a piece of leaf or a whole blossom, it can really add some interest and excitement to your regular humdrum meals. Yeah, I think as we embrace edible gardening and food gardening, then hopefully that spills over into our kitchens too, and we get more creative and have fun cooking. And I think that's where ed edible flowers are really fun because they allow us to do some really fun things in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I want to bring up, speaking of fruit, because we have lemon courses all the time and we offer extra workshops in that. Mm -hmm. What about lemons? I've heard that they are edible, that the, the flowers of lemons are edible. What have you heard, Steve? Yes, so lemon flowers, edible orange flowers, edible, and you could dry those petals and, and use them in some kind of preparation. I've bought orange flower extract and, mm -hmm. and used that, which is very flavorful. So yes, indeed, you can use those in many different ways. Okay, that's fantastic. Use your house plants, use your garden plants, find ways to add that bit of extra interest to your supper time. Good. We'll be back next week, and next week on the podcast, we are talking about raspberries. We'd love it if you drop by to say hi online at foodgardenlife.com. We have articles about growing fruit, veg, using your homegrown produce, also about growing figs and lemons in cold climates. So say hi. Tell us the topics that would help you grow more of your own. Also, grab our free newsletter. Subscribers get the subscriber-only cold climate fig guide and small space food gardening tip sheet. And you can head over to my website and grab my really cool printable PDF for a seed packet. You can personalize it for each type of seeds that you save. DonnaBalzer.com. Have a look. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. I'm Stephen Biggs. And I'm Donna Balzer, here to help you grow. Mm -hmm.